Hello, making sure everyone is joining us. Yes, we are good to go. So thanks for joining us for today's CRED webinar on going remote, effective remote hiring and onboarding. So extremely relevant topic and we've got a really great diverse mix of perspectives today to help answer some of your questions and things you should be thinking about, whether you've been hiring and onboarding during this time or whether it's something that you're planning for the future. So joining us today, we've got Vivek, who's the CEO of HackerRank, a huge technical assessment and remote interview platform. They've seen a ton across companies, and he can give us a really great overview of the landscape and some best practices. Wayne is the head of engineering at Top Hatter. We can off he'll offer a great perspective on how Top Hatter has adapted and any tips or challenges they've seen with their team. And then we have Erica, who's the head of global and talent acquisition at LiveRamp hoping she can share some hiring tactics and also some tips around communicating to both candidates and internally within your organizations. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Excited. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. This is going to be a, a fun one. So this is actually our first panel of the CRED webinar series. Um, so before we let the panelists formally introduce themselves, a bit of housekeeping from our end. Um, first and foremost, drop your questions in the chat. So we want to ensure that we leave time for your questions and that you get your questions answered. So anytime throughout the, the webinar, anytime that we're asking the questions, drop questions in that you want to get answered and we'll make sure that we leave enough time to address them at the end. And then second, this court recording will be shared tomorrow with everyone who registered, and it will also be publicly available on the CRED blog and our YouTube channel starting tomorrow. So be sure to watch out for that if you want to rewatch the recording or share it with anybody that might find it useful. Okay, so for the sake of today's conversation and topic, we're gonna split the conversation into two areas. The first is the recruitment portion. So we're looking at the hiring process and kind of from posting a job opening to making an offer. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the onboarding process. So what happens from when you make the offer to the employee's first few days or weeks? So let's get started by some quick introductions. So 30 seconds um, to a minute, tell us a little bit about the company that you work for and what changes you've made to your recruitment process. Um, since we've shifted to going remotely. So Vivek, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, everyone, who've, uh, who've dialed into this webinar. I'm Vivek. I'm one of the founders and CEO of HackerRank. Our mission at HackerRank is to accelerate the world's innovation, and we do that by increasing the supply of developers in the world, matching them to the right jobs, and empowering companies to manage their workforce, developer workforce based on skills. So those are the three pillars of our strategy, how we do it. We've been about alive for about seven years um, and we have transformed the uh, hiring process for over 2000 companies across the globe. We have over 11 million developers who have attempted some kind of a challenge or, a, or an assessment through our platform. And just last year, about 10% of the developers who changed jobs took an assessment on HackerRank. So that's a quick overview of what we do. In terms of what we have changed, I mean, I think the big change has been on a remote hiring. Every every hire, I mean, there's no concept of an onsite right now. So how do you make sure that you can trans? Um, how, how do you make sure you can translate whatever happens on an onsite in a remote setting with as much fidelity, if not higher? Has been an interesting challenge. So we've built a lot of tools and solutions to make that happen. I'm happy to happy to talk about that more. Uh, since you asked, one big change that we did, um, we have. We have started to get way more rigorous in preparing interviewers before they go and talk to a candidate. I mean, in, in essence, this was like a debt that we we're trying to fill up because we should have actually done this in the past. But usually that debt is fixed during a real onsite because you have callway conversations where you can actually ask, hey, what did you think about this candidate? What should I interview on and others? But right now you don't have an opportunity. You just see a candidate invite you have to jump in and you meet the candidate. So you need to be very, very clear on what skills you're looking to interview. Have you been prepared? Um, so, so that's one aspect that we've actually uh, amped up a lot. Great, thank you. And we'll certainly dive into some more tips um, that you can share uh, once we get into more questions. Um, Wayne, go ahead. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for joining us today, and thanks for, for having me. Um, I'm the head of engineering at uh, Top Hatter. We are a live auction marketplace um, founded in 2009, launched in 2011. Uh, we focus on discovery shopping. So I, I like to think of it as the, the most fun way to hunt for deals. Um, and uh, I'd say like uh, something similar to, to Vivek actually, is there, there's a lot of debt around documentation. We're a fast moving startup. And in order to effectively onboard um, in a fully remote capacity, we've now had f uh, four engineers on board in a fully remote capacity now. Uh, we've had to rely on putting a lot more structure on that onboarding process, actually documenting what it is and making sure all the relevant uh, technical documentation um, exists in order to support that, that onboarding process uh, really, really well. Um, obviously, a lot of the same things as Vivek mentioned in terms of the actual interview process, trying to uh, convey that same sense of, uh, of what an onsite um, is going to offer both both to the employer, but also to the candidate has been a, a big challenge. But I'd say uh, you know one of the biggest things that we've, we've done is actually in, in helping to support the onboarding process in, in a fully remote way. Amazing, thank you. And Erica. Hi there, thanks so much again for having us, appreciate it. Um, why I oversee talent acquisition at LiveRamp. So we are a global organization. We are 1100 employees strong across the globe, based here in the US, based in San Francisco. We have a handful of offices in APAC and a handful in EMEA. Um, we really, what LiveRamp does is we aspire to make a safe and easy, <coughs> excuse me, we, we aspire to make it safe and easy to use data connectivity. We're the leader in that industry. Um, and we continue to grow and ensure that there are secure platforms to be able to sh share data across companies. Um, as for the challenges or the changes that we've made, Vivek, you guys took my answers. <laughs> we've made much the same changes, right? Is that you have to go from, you see people in person to doing it remotely. How do you get your hiring teams prepared for that? And how do you get your candidates prepared for that? Candidates typically haven't had to do it this way either. So they're learning right along with us. So we've been able to implement some ways of getting candidates better prepared on the front end, as well as better preparing our hiring managers on the back end during the interview process. And then also to the onboarding piece that we need to make sure that we are bringing people in and embracing them into the live ramp culture. And that's a big part of our onboarding. And it's so important. We hold that so near and dear to live ramp that we want to make sure that we, we embrace that early on in their career. Okay, lots of lots of questions, and I'm sure uh, our audience has lots of questions around those three areas. So, Erica, can you just start talk about how the process or how communicating internally to your team has changed? Did you guys, you know, did you have a document before that outlined the process, and you had to update that, or did you not have one before? Tell us a little bit more about some of those changes. Sure. So, we did have a process in place. Thankfully, we've had a fairly solid process for recruiting in place, both for the, the recruiting part of it, right? So the sourcing of talent, as well as the interviewing of talent, but it changed, it kind of flipped on its ear in a matter of moments when we were said, when we were told, hey, we're not letting visitors in the office anymore. Okay, what do we do? So in a matter of hours, we were actually able to put together tools for the hiring managers, which outlines really what our process is, but how do you do it differently now that you're looking at somebody over a blue jeans call rather than sitting in, an interview room talking with them face to face. How do you go about whiteboarding? You can't just turn and look at the wall and start whiteboarding with somebody. You have to figure out how to do that virtually. Um, so we started putting those tools together. We also wanted to make sure that we figured out what the process looks like for candidates. So we needed to implement something along those lines. One thing that we're super proud of at LiveRamp is that we have this amazing office space and we don't get to show that off anymore. So we actually put together a virtual office tour. As much as I love that it would be um, virtual reality, it's not today. It really is a slideshow that shows what our office space looks like, talks about the amenities that we have. So that helps sell candidates rather than we don't get to walk them through the amazing space. They get to walk themselves through it through a virtual tour. And that's been really helpful. And that has that has absolutely changed the way that we've done things is welcoming candidates into LiveRamp without welcoming welcoming them through our doors. Yeah. That's a great idea. And have you changed anything else about what you communicate to candidates in terms of the hiring process? Yeah, so we actually have added a step and this is fairly recent. We've we've iterated numerous times over the three months that we've been remote, but we've now instated a, a candidate prep call a few days before their actual 
on-site, as we call it, interview. So we meet, we have a recruiter meet with the candidates 15, 20 minutes a few days before to make sure that their blue jeans is functioning, that if they have to share a presentation, that they know how to share their screen, that they know the functionality behind it, as well as coaching them, much like any recruiter should do, coaching them on, these are the people that you're meeting with, these are the types of questions that you're gonna be asked walking them through that. So we have added that layer on there to help prepare candidates a little bit more. We also have our recruiting coordinators log in five minutes before the virtual interview actually starts to greet the candidate, welcome them, make sure that they do have everything that they need. Do you have a glass of water along with you? You're gonna be here for three hours. Are you ready for this? To make them feel comfortable. Um, and then lastly, to, to again, keep the candidate really engaged is at the end, the recruiter hops on the very end of the call after the interviewers go away and we make sure that how to go, how was your interview? How was your experience? What could we do differently? We need that feedback to, to continue improving upon this. We're going to be doing this for at least another three months. So we need to make sure that we're doing it really well and that the candidates are still excited about live ramp. Great. Thank you. Um, and Wayne, you mentioned that you guys have made some changes um, as well, obviously everyone has, but what about internally within your team? Have you changed anything in your process? Um, you know, Erica brought up a good point. Are you still doing three or four hour long interviews? Are you guys breaking them up? What's changed for you guys internally? Yeah, I think one of the things uh, Erica mentioned that's that's right on point is is the feedback and, and the iterations. I think it's it's so critical. Um, you're, you're not going to know exactly you know, what the 100% what the perfect way to respond to the situation is going to be. And you could spend the next three months not not interviewing people and, and trying to hypothesize about what that is. But I think you've got to rely on your gut and and go and experiment and try things. So I think one of the things with, with uh, Top Hatter being a little bit of a smaller company startup um, sort of um, mindset is that we we very much focus on, on experimentation, both in the product, but also in, in our process. And so um, thankfully, um, leading up to, to the to the uh, pandemic, uh, we, we've actually instituted a lot of changes that uh, made the transition a lot easier for, for us, I, I think. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of engineering hiring, the, the first couple steps are, are already um, sort of fully um, remote. Uh, you do an intro call, you do a technical screen. Those those aren't on site, um, and so not much has to change. Um, I, th I think there are a lot of other industries and a lot of other functions where that's not the case, and the changes have had to be a lot more substantial. Um, but uh, but but in terms of the big changes, I, I think um, I, I, uh, it's really easy, you know, when you're in a in a fully remote on site interview to forget about including breaks. Um, and, and, and some of the things that we have in, in a more traditional on-site interview, like, like the lunch, which is a, a great way, a less formal way for candidates to meet with, uh, with, with team members. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we actually didn't even realize that we had omitted those things. We thought, hey, it's already long enough. Like, where can we remove some things? And, you know, I think we, we looked at lunches and things like that. We, we got our interview process down. It's not super, super long. Um, but, uh, but it was actually through, through candidate feedback where we said, oh, well, we, you know, they're actually looking for these things and we should, we should add them back mm -hmm. in. Um, the one thing that going fully remote on, on uh, fr from from the onsite perspective has really helped us with is actually on the scheduling side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to fly people out anymore. We don't need to make sure they're available for four and a half to five hours in one single block. Uh, we can accommodate candidate schedules a lot easier. We can do half the onsite. We can schedule the rest on another day. Um, so, so I, at least from that perspective, things have been a, a little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. Vivek, I love you mentioned you guys are pulling together documents and things to help prep us. So give us a peek into what those look like and how can we better prep? Like what practices can we put in place to ensure the virtual interview process mirrors an in-person one? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I think, um, I think the way we are thinking about even building a product, firstly, we talk to a lot of customers. Uh, there are a lot of customers who are like hiring. Um, in fact, they're accelerating their hiring, in fact, um, Atlassian, Bloomberg, Amazon, these are like companies that we work with who are accelerating the hiring because they just, their needs, the needs for, of their product is just continuing to rise at a pretty rapid rate. So we're working with them uh, pretty closely to make sure that we can build a, build a product that, and, 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 it's a, and it's an interesting nuance that we need to take care of, which is there are certain advantages that you can actually have in a virtual setting. And there are also certain disadvantages that you need to have. So it's important that we just don't blindly mirror what happened in the physical on-site to a virtual one. So let me give you an advantage of that. So in a in a traditional kind of coding interview, when you bring somebody on-site, 
you're probably going to ask this person to, hey, go to the whiteboard and start to write code. Um, and no developer has actually written code on a whiteboard on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just it's just not the best tool for you to use. You can use whiteboard for other things. You can use whiteboard for like maybe diagramming or just like brainstorming and others, but not to write code. But it's also a little not personal if you actually sit in front of the candidate with a computer or with a Mac and ask them to do a pair program. I mean, it's it's a little bit little awkward unless you set the expectations right. But in a virtual setting, for example. That's actually great. You know, I, I think like candidates would actually love it because you're already in front of your Mac or, or, or PC. And, and now you're actually going to start to code, which is a much better reflection of how good of a developer you are. And it's also more comfortable for a developer to actually say, hey, let me just ex express my thoughts on writing code on, on this editor as opposed to, um, you know, as, a, as opposed to just like, you know, writing something on whiteboard, which I'm not used to. I mean, that's an example of an advantage. An example of a disadvantage is I think one of them pointed out which is in an on-site setting, there is nothing called as a preparation. You just walk in into the lobby, you sit down, you have somebody greet you, welcome, and then like they take you to different conference rooms to do the interviews and, and others. But here, you need to make sure that you can actually set up your system right. Um, you know, each there are like people who use different tools. For example, this is the first time I'm using any meeting. So you got to get uh, familiarized with like, hey, where is the mic? Where is the uh, video? Is my Bluetooth working? Is it not? And and those things are important because uh, your first impression, fortunately or unfortunately, creates a big amount of bias in the recruiting process. So if you start to struggle in the first five, 10 minutes, you know, you just start to lose your confidence and it also impacts your interview. So one of the lessons that we learned from Atlassian was every meeting, every interview, they have the first 10, 10 minutes, they have two calendar invites. The first 10 minutes is called logistics setting. Like all they do is like make sure that you're setting up for logistics and making sure the candidates feel good. Okay, you know, this time is just for me to set up my logistics um, to do it. So th that's an example of a sort of a disadvantage uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a virtual setting, which you wouldn't have in a typically in a normal uh, physical onsite, which you need to overcome. So we're being designing and working with products uh, and solutions with our customers to make sure that it's unique experience that can offer as much fidelity, if not higher, than, than the on-site. And then the other part, and I'll, and I'll just pause uh, because I just don't want this to be like a one-on-one -on -one between you and me. Um, and the other part is just like, you know, much more broader spectrum, which is, hey, what can you do on remote, remote hiring in general? This is just interviewing pieces that we're innovating and making it better. But then this can completely change the game of like the talent map and the talent world on who you can hire, where you can hire from. It, that completely is super disruptive. Uh, that's another piece of the equation that we're working on as well. Great. And, are, you know, it's probably a twofold. You guys are thinking that companies are going to start requesting it and or companies are, you know, wanting to demand or request more features on the platform. Um, are there any other requests or features that you guys are working on that, you know, will be rolling out in the coming months? Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. There are, there, are, there are lots, like little things. Um, how do you make sure that uh, you you have, uh, how do you make sure that you can con conduct multiple interviews strung together into a nice candidate packet in a remote setting? I mean, you want to you want to be able to, like, for example, we have a pair programming solution called CodePair, which allows you to see each other on a video call. You can collaborate and you can pair program. But that's usually used for, or it used to be used just for like a pre-screening round when you had the real onsite. But now pretty much all of the onsite is now compressed into a virtual setting. So you need to make sure that you can build the workflows that can make it easy enough for the interviewer to just like go and click on one link and easy for the candidate to also not get confused as to which interviewer is interviewing me on what. So there's a lot of different workflows that you need to do. It's kind of resembling mimicking conference rooms, but just in an easier way to do it. So that's an example of one. The second one that we're starting to work on is how do you make sure that you can share real world projects, uh, which is part of the which is part of the round um, that that people use in a, in a in a setting. The third one, of course, is whiteboard. We've integrated like a very cool whiteboard uh, for system design. You can actually collaboratively draw. You can also use your iPad if you want to go ahead and draw. And this is not for coding, but it's just for diagramming. So. That, there's, there's actually so much that, that we're doing. Um, it's, it's going to be a pretty exciting few months for us from a product and uh, engineering perspective. Yeah, it's amazing. Opportunity to come out with something new and really innovate. Yep. Um, Erica, any new tools that you guys are using since going remote for either hiring or onboarding? 
Yeah, so we have, we've been playing around with a variety of whiteboarding tools. We haven't landed on one. We're just kind of, we're figuring out which one makes the most sense for us right now. And that was because we didn't have a choice. We had to figure out a virtual whiteboarding tool quickly. Um, but again, haven't landed on one that is perfect for us yet. Um, Ch we have check those out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> will do, thank you. <laughs> um, we also have been using Higher View more and more. That was something, that was a tool that we primarily used for our, our university relations. Something, you know, it's a virtual anytime interviewing tool. A, a campus student can interview them, you know, they could do their online interview at two o'clock in the morning if they felt that that's the best time that they can present themselves. Um, we've been using that more and more just because it does make the screening process a little bit easier. Um, those are the primary tools that we've really seen come into play. We're using BlueJeans more and more. It feels like we probably broke it in the first month just based on the sheer volume of interviews that we were doing, but nothing much out beyond that. And is that higher view, is that the one where they can upload a video of themselves at any time and then you can just as a recruiter or someone yeah roll through as many as you would like and kind of, yeah. Exactly, so it, it's timely for both the candidate and the hiring manager. A candidate can do it whenever they're available, right? So they just pull it up on their phone, they answer the listed questions. Um, it's timed, it can be essays, it can be that they actually physically answer the questions verbally, there's a whole variety. And then to the flip side is that hiring managers can go in and watch it whenever they're available. You know, they could be watching TV at night and at the same time they could be flipping through their higher view videos. Not yeah. that I recommend that because that's not assessing very well, but it happens. And what platforms did you use before? Did you guys, do you guys have an applicant tracking system that oh, you're still yeah. using and just all this on top of that? Yeah, so everything's added on, layered on. Greenhouse is our applicant tracking system. We've been using that for a number of years. Um, that's not going to go anywhere. That is truly where we're keeping our candidate pool. It integrates with our um, our HRAS. It integrates with HireVue. It, hire, it integrates with our assessment tools. All of that all ties in together. So it does make it a one-stop shop, thankfully, for the recruiting team. Now, of course, all the candidates, they need to go out and use the various platforms, but it does make it easier for the recruiters to find all the data in one place. As with the hiring managers, they have the same access as recruiters. Right, which is even more important now that they're, you were remote, you can't just walk Absolutely. over like, and ask and ask him for that feedback or send yep. them that recruiter, right? So, um, Wayne, any tools that you guys have used, um, either implemented or kind of enhanced that you used to use before we went virtual? Yeah. So before we went virtual, we didn't. We, we I guess we we're, we're not strong believers in whiteboarding interviews. Uh, we we focus on what we think are practical skills that are essential for candidates to be successful, which involves a lot of coding, practical aspects of coding, not um, knowledge of esoteric algorithms or anything like that. But uh, but you know your ability to navigate a foreign code base to find a bug. You know your ability to refactor code. Things that we think are really important. Um, and so we facilitated all of that using tools like CoderPad um, and. Um, you know, using Zoom to to facilitate the the communications. Um, so so not much has actually changed about that, other than you know I think uh, uh, candidates now um, have the ability to use their own their own computer uh, when they do when they do the on, the sort of virtual on site portion of it. Sometimes you know they didn't have access to one, they needed to use a loaner, which is completely foreign to them. Sometimes they didn't know how to use a Mac. Um, so, so a lot of those problems I, I think went away. And I, I and I agree with all the, the the prep calls and the prep materials. We've been a huge proponent of, of sending out prep materials for all the technical in interviews, including the the tech screen. I think it's um it's important to set expectations with candidates around uh, you know how will the, how you know what will the the how will the exercise sort of flow and and what are you being evaluated against like what's important to the interviewer um, and, uh, and and so uh, you know th that prep material I think has been key for for us to being successful moving all of our on sites to uh, to a virtual um, uh, setting because it outlines exactly how you need to set up your PC or Mac in order to be able to do the um, the technical exercises so we, we provide all of that in in advance and in terms of um, in terms of sourcing um, and and you know tools for for helping with the recruiting side of things, I think we have, you know, we have to recognize that uh, there's been a pretty sudden and, and jarring shift from you know let's say like mid February where it was a really really strong candidates market. Uh, candidates were entertaining three four plus offers at any given time to now being more of an employer's market. And uh, and I think it's it's a good time if you haven't already to reevaluate all the tools that you're using and to and to you know just uh, you know, reset your expectations around what what you can actually get from from a lot of these tools. You know, things like LinkedIn Recruiter, we know has you know historically the the response rate on in mails is pretty 
pretty terrible. But when you have a lot of people looking for jobs, that response rate is now decently high. And so revisiting some of those tools, I think, is an important part of adjusting to, to this new sort of um, situation that we're in. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, Vivek, what interview processes or formalities do you think are here to stay you know, if and when we go back to on-site live interviews? Um, I think um, I, I will answer the question in a slightly different way. I think the, the purpose of the on-site interview will fundamentally change when we, when we come back to the normal. Uh, right now, on-site interviews are usually, hey, I'm going to invite a candidate and grill this person for four hours in a conference room and, and then tell the candidate, hey, okay, we'll follow up with you in a couple of days or something like that. I think the on-site interviews in the future, there will still be an on-site, but, but you would have almost made your decision that you know, you're going to hire this person because people are getting used to the fact that you can assess the skills in a remote way. It's more convenient. It's more flexible, both for the candidate as well as for others. And on-site will be more about the candidate experiencing your work, your culture, your team. Maybe there will be one round where you're going to meet with the hiring manager or your culture fit team or something on those lines to, to, to validate uh, but it'll be more about that putting the candidate at the focus at the center point as opposed to the as opposed to the company. And and it's also very convenient or it's better for a candidate because there's there's a very high friction right now. If, if I'm if I as a candidate have to interview, well, when I say right now, when you know, maybe like pre-COVID, because if I have to get invited to an on-site, I have to block five hours. Mm-hmm. And I have to work from home or I have to give some reason to an employer. And just think from a candidate perspective, I'm interviewing. I'm also interviewing at least at three companies. You know, it's not that I'm just interviewing at one company. So you have to just block like three days in, in like a pretty close window for five hours where you're not working. How many times will you go to the dentist's office, you know, for this for the same reason? Uh, it's it's not convenient. Um, it's not good for the candidate. Uh, we actually have seen candidates actually willing to take interviews post five o'clock. Mm-hmm. It's just easier for them to do it. Like you would never, it would never happen that way in an in an onsite setting. So I think those are big changes that you can actually see happen in the future uh, when we get back into working. Yeah, Wayne and Erica, you guys are both nodding in agreement for all yeah. those. Anything else you want to add of anything I- that? either yeah. changing, not coming back. I, you know, so part of what I, th- I think is going to change, I, I don't know about, we haven't gotten that far on live ramp to figure that part out, but I really foresee it is that we're not going to have, we fly people in from all over the country for our university relations, right? Is we're bringing students in to interview in San Francisco. Really not necessary, I don't think. I think that we will absolutely be able to adapt it where it is completely virtual. Um, we might want to bring them into the office that they'd be working in just so that they can see it. But to Vivek's point is that sell them on the experience, sell them on the company. It's not for us to grill them. It's for them to grill us during that time. I'm a firm believer that recruiting is a two-way street. It's not just the company falling in love with the candidate. The candidate needs to fall in love with us also. And that's really what it's going to start gearing towards. Um, our recruiting process for university is also going to change. And we actually, this was pre-COVID that we had made this decision is that we weren't going to go on campus this coming fall, is that we decided that we were going to do it all virtually. So we were ahead of the curve and already had started planning on that when we started getting the notifications from the universities that their, that their campuses are closed for the fall. Um, so we're ahead of that curve because it is something that we can do virtually. And quite honestly, students for the most part are totally fine not having to go to career fairs and talk to 30 different employers um, other than to get the free pens and the the swag that they get from a career fair. I think that they will be just as thankful to do it online. Yeah, I mean, it's a time and and money saver for them, just the uh, time investment, right? Absolutely. Yeah, by the way, that is is a big shift if you think about Mm -hmm. it, Uh, you know, if you, I, I just think anything that hasn't changed for 10 or 15 years is bound to change. And university recruiting is one that hasn't changed for 10 or 15 years. Uh, think about all the technology breakthroughs and innovations that we have had, but like to hire the best and the brightest computer science college grads, there's no use of technology. We fly to, we fly to campuses and because you have to fly, there's so much operational logistics issues. So you can only fly to 10 campuses. And guess what, whether you're a Google 
or a small company, everybody goes to the same 10 campuses. And there are 400 schools in North America that has computer science people graduating every year. So you miss out on a majority of talent. It's super time consuming. And, and, you, and you're fighting, everyone is fighting for the same pool, which obviously makes it look like the supply is a constraint, but it's an artificial constraint that we have in our heads, which drives up the price. And you're just gonna pay a tremendous amount of pay and others to, 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 to developers in general. Uh, I think those things will completely change because now what, the way that Erica is actually saying, like you, you're just you're just opening up the playing field. It doesn't matter which school you graduated. It, I don't care whether it's a tier one school, tier two, or or how are you want to classify Ivy League or non Ivy League, or or you know what, forget whether you even have a computer science degree or not. I don't care as long as you're able to have the skills. I can you can surface up and you can get a job anywhere you would like. That's a fundamental shift. And once companies start to get I mean, getting used to that kind of a mode, it is going to be super hard for you to convince, okay, in 2021, let's actually go ahead and visit these 10 schools. I mean, you're going to ask why. Why do I need to do it when I've been able to hire like 50 of the brightest minds across the country without moving anywhere? I'm just sitting at home. That will be a fundamentally big, big shift uh, that you can see happening. Yeah. Okay. And this is great. So I want to shift into more of the onboarding kind of experience or process. Um, and you bring up a great point, Vivek, which is competition. So some of this obviously is to come because we're predicting what's going to happen in the future. But um, you know, when you brought up a great point around just tactics and engagement strategies for reaching out to candidates. So what are some strategies you're using to convince candidates to choose Top Hatter? Um, are, are you mentioned you've hired some remotely, so if you're kind of getting into that, it's obviously a, you know, you probably have a, a lot of eager people right now that unfortunately have been laid off from a position or on the job hunt, but have you guys talked a little bit about competition and, and kind of convincing or um, how you sweeten the deal to get them to sign on the, the dotted line? Yeah, I, I think giving them confidence about, um, you know, onboarding and actually working in a remote capacity and that you actually have a plan and that they're just not going to show up and be the first person and they're going to need to figure it out on their own, I think is what gives a lot of the candidates that we've spoken to a lot of confidence in our ability to be able to onboard them successfully in a fully remote capacity. In terms of tools, um, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, my strategy is hasn't shifted a, a ton. Um, I, I think we are reevaluating a lot of the tools that we're using um, to to you know, determine their their efficacy relative to their to their cost. Um, but uh, but but I think uh, you know there, there there are unfortunately a lot of people that have been impacted by layoffs. But there are lists as as well of these individuals, parachute list and and others. And and I think if you're not on there sending out reach outs, you're you're missing opportunities to connect with candidates, even if it's not the right opportunity, the, the right timing now um, to to build that relationship and to be able to uh, you know potentially close them out in in, in the future for for a, a given role. So I think um, so. So I think uh, you know one of the things that uh, that I've been pushing for and that that I recommend is is you know reevaluating your tools, but also reevaluating the contracts that you have with contingency agencies and and you know all the service providers that you're that you're using. I think they're acutely aware that it's it's becoming more and more of an employer's market, and and they have less leverage. Um, you know we're seeing contingency rates fall from 25. You know we have you know some some agencies as high as 30 percent falling down to 20 20 percent, 17 and a half. Um, so if you're not taking an opportunity to to you know to to look at those and make sure that you know from a, a pricing perspective you're 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 optimizing for the current situation. I think you're missing an opportunity to to save some money and to optimize your cost per hire. Sure. And any timely advice for engineering candidates that are looking for jobs yeah. right now besides checking out Top Adder? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I, th I think keep in mind that there are that you know that there are many more candidates per available role these days, which which is you know terrifying, honestly, if you're looking for a job right now. Um, and so you have to focus on what's going to set you apart from everyone else. And, and so I think um, you know spending some time to to highlight um, you know on your resume the, the kinds of impacts and, and, the, and the kinds of learnings you had uh, have had in, in past roles I think it's more important than you know what, what people typically do which is just a, a dump of skills um, because I, I think we really need to see in that first 30 seconds that there's something that sets you apart 
The other thing that I can't stress enough and is, is a little bit of a, a pet peeve of mine is um, do some research on the company. You, you should absolutely not have any calls with the company uh, until you've done at least some basic homework on, you know, what does the company do? What industry are they in? Come with tough, you know, tough questions. The tougher, the better. It shows it shows me that that you really are, are taking your time to assess the opportunities carefully um, and that you've done your research on the company. And that, that to me really sets them apart. So so those are the recommendations I, I'd have for, for anyone that happens to be in, in a position to look for jobs at the moment. Yeah, I love it. The company and the person you're speaking to, right? I, I love when the questions are, are targeted towards me and my background or specific things to show that they've actually looked up in research. Um, Vivek, any tips for us on upskilling? advice for engineering candidates looking for jobs right now? Sure, uh, maybe the first thing is uh, whatever is in um, Erica's background, I hope it's not a virtual one, be fearless. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important. Companies need, um, it, it, oftentimes it's lost on the candidates as much as probably the, the needle has sort of slightly shifted to employer market, but I still think it's, it's still a candidate market when it comes to like salaries and, and, and other pieces of it. It hasn't like, uh, you know, fallen, fallen dramatically, but just, just, it's always good perspective to remember that companies need you as much as you need, uh, the company, uh, and, and not, not saying this to like, you know, boost your ego or anything, but, but it gives you a level of confidence that, Hey, you are important, uh, as well. Uh, you know, the company is also sort of desperate to get you because they also want to ship great products and, and things on those lines. The second one is, um, a lot of times, um, I mean, we we always try to operate in this uh, perspective and we encourage our customers to operate in this perspective is your goal in the interview process should be designed to figure out what the best version of the candidate looks like um, and not to just prove that you're smarter than, than them. Uh, you can, I mean, like a lot of times, like companies design their interview process to just feel smart so that they have like a little bit of a street cred where everybody around them says, oh, this is like the smartest interview process, toughest one, like only 1% get through, only 0.1% get through. I, I actually think it's kind of like meaningless. You need to make sure that your interview process figures out what the max potential of this candidate is or looks like or could be and, and design it around that. And, and in order for you to do that, we actually encourage companies to actually share in detail what skills you're going to evaluate, what is the prep doc look like, even to the extent of saying who's going to interview you. And, and there, there's always some resistance that I hear from some customers. Oh, if we share all the things that, that, that we're going to ask, um, you know, they will come prepared. No, you're just like sharing here are the skills that you need to do. I mean, otherwise, like if I'm a candidate, I'm just going to jump on a call and I'm not sure. Are you going to ask me an algorithm question? Are you going to ask me to walk through a project? Are you going to ask me how to design Twitter's newsfeed? It's just very hard for me to figure out as a candidate to do it. So if companies don't do it, I would recommend at candidates proactively asking the potential company or the recruiter to, to literally like, hey, can you tell me all the things that you're going to be assessing me on? Um, and, and like, can I even like talk to an interviewer before just for 15 minutes to kind of get an understanding as to where it is, if you don't have a formalized prep talk. So I would yeah. say those two are very high needle movers, uh, to increase your odds or chances of getting there. And the last one, there is a group of companies I would call tech first, um, you know, sort of Atlassian, Twilio, and, and then FinTech, uh, at least from an enterprise perspective. Uh, they are hiring like crazy. It's 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 kind of like off the charts. Uh, so if you're trying to prioritize and others, um, prioritize Top Hatter, Live Ramp, and then all these companies. Uh, so I would say like you know those are some other things. Awesome. And have you guys seen an uptick in the platform uh, use and shelter in place? Yeah, tremendous. Uh, I mean, like you know what we are seeing and what we are seeing in our install base is we have uh, our customer bases. They have two categories. One. Categories, of course, a lot of small businesses in certain industries like travel, hospitality, and others being hugely impacted. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other bucket, which is like all the companies that I mentioned on tech first and fintech companies that are rapidly growing. And the the usage has not just balanced, but has increased because now we used to power two, two interview rounds or three interview rounds out of the six or something like that. Now we are powering all the interview rounds for all these companies and their hiring volumes are increasing. So definitely we've seen a huge uptick in our platform usage. That's great. 
Um, last question I have, and then um, again, want to make sure we get to your questions. So drop your questions in the chat, or you can send them through um, through the the platform, and, and we can get them answered for you. So, um, Erica, this is uh, more about the onboarding process and culture. So you you talked a little bit about the library culture and how that does help really selling candidates um, for you guys. So, what are some virtual tactics you know that you've done incorporated into the onboarding process? or just new things that you've introduced to help candidates feel the culture being virtual on their first day or their first couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, it, it's such a such an important piece is that you want to make sure that people are bought into your company from day one or even pre day one, right? As soon as they sign that offer, you need to make sure that they're really embraced. Our, our onboarding program is what we call on ramp. So it is a two day online session. Um, where it is a variety of instructor-led trainings that really, again, explain what LiveRamp does, gets into some of the nitty gritty, talks about the HR aspect of things, talks about the culture. Um, it covers all of that. So again, some of it is instructor-led. So, and when I say instructor, meaning business partner-led, right? So the business is really leading it. And then some of it is web-based, so they can go in and do on-demand training sessions. Um, Along with that, we make sure that their manager, that their new manager is incorporating them into some sort of a team event, whether in as hard as that is virtually, but do you do a team lunch their first day? Everybody sits down in their dining room by themselves and has lunch with one another. Um, how do they incorporate that, right? How do you truly welcome somebody to your team and get to know each other since you don't have them standing or sitting right next to you at their desk like they typically would? So we make sure that we incorporate that as well and continuous check-ins. It is about communicating and embracing, is reach out to your person every day, have a check-in in the morning, have a check-in in the afternoon for their first few weeks and get them a buddy. Get them somebody that they can feel comfortable asking what they may feel is a silly question. There are no silly questions when you're new to a company, but you may feel like, I'm not gonna pick up my phone and ask my boss this question that, I, that maybe he'll think that I should know. Not the case, you can pick up the phone, send a Slack over to your buddy, to really help you learn more about LiveRamp. And that's truly the culture is that we're here to help each other out and really move the company forward. And a, a question that just came through, Erica, is have you guys added in any new sessions to your onboarding process? So, you know, did you have a buddy before or is this just something that was new? And is there any additional sessions in that um, on-ramp training that are new because you're sheltering in place or you're virtual? Sure. So the buddy program was actually something that we were just about to institute right before we went to shelter in place. So somehow it was like somebody knew that this was all going to happen. So we'd started doing things offline already, hypothetically, right? But we, we that is something that was in place. We also, I would say that we have added some sessions, right? Is really the IT session, making sure that new employees are super comfortable with blue jeans. We spend eight hours a day on blue jeans conferences. So we want to make sure that people truly understand that. But other than that, the sessions really are exactly the same as they would have been had they been live. Um, the primary difference would be is if somebody, if we, if we had hired somebody in London, we fly them into San Francisco for their on ramping sessions. Obviously now they don't have to do that. That's the biggest change to that. Now everybody's on the exact same playing field. Nobody has jet lag, any of that, is that it really is just bringing everybody together. The cohorts are experiencing it exactly the same. Great, thank you. Um, another question, I guess, um, we might open this up to everybody, um, but Vivek, I might start with you. Um, what can you recommend, um, or can you recommend the best job boards that you use? Um, or that you've seen, are they niche or are they more kind of universal broad? Like, so is it more, are there any job boards that are specific for technical that you prefer or um, just kind of more broad general generalization across a lot of types of roles? Yeah, no, it's a good question. We're actually trying to, we're actually trying to build one. Um, so I don't want to come across as, as like a promotion for the product. There is a job board, developer job board on Hacker Rank that we're building one. Um, unfortunately, there is there is a little bit of um, there's a little bit little bit of a skepticism by a lot of candidates on applying through a job board or even at the career page because they view that it is like a black box experience. Which is, I apply and I'm not like going to hear back from anyone, so might as well try to see if I know somebody in the company and try to get a referral or try to directly email reach out to the recruiter or others. We've not yet actually really figured out. As, a, as an HR tech industry to give confidence to candidates to say, hey, we are going to reach out, reach back out to you 
whether that's on your careers page or, or your job board, was actually one of the premise that how we're actually working to, to make the developer job board that we're trying to do better. Um, I would say it's instead of doing a wide canvas on which is the best job board, uh, align on a list of companies that you can that that you're really really interested in uh, from a mission perspective, from the type of work perspective, and others. Uh, I cringe to say this, but I think the first thing would be to figure out who you know in that particular company who can actually get you a referral, and then the second one would actually be to try and go through the different job boards to do it. Um, this actually highlights a, a systemic problem that we have in the HR tech on, hey, why isn't there a good job board? Like, why can't we build that? I'm sure that's to come. That's great. Um, and I love what you said just about, you know, even before making it an easy experience for candidates, right? It's, it's not necessarily helpful to the, to the employer to say we decline so many interviews that we take. That's kind of a waste on, on both sides. So making sure that the candidate has a great experience, they have, they're informed about the process and what they need to know to be successful. So that way it's a win-win, right? The, the candidate gets a job that they love and they're passionate about and the, it's e an easier process for the employer, right? Yeah, I mean, like, there are, there are just, like, a lot of things. I mean, firstly, most job descriptions are just, like, canned text. They just copy mm -hmm. from one place to another. You, you're you not very clear on explaining what the basic criteria is for you to apply. Am I qualified or not? Um, and, and then there's always a hesitation to respond saying, no, we're not choosing you. Or it's usually an autoresponder email where you just hit the reject button and it goes... There's just there's just like so many little nuances that that needs to be figured out in order for you to make a really good product, which is which is what we're trying to work towards. Yeah, definitely. Well, time time flies, and we are out of time. So um, I want to thank you guys all very much for sharing some perspectives um, and just some good tips. I think everyone learned um, something that they could try their own company. Um, or if they're a candidate, something that they can look for. So really appreciate. I want to give you guys the opportunity to share one last tactic or tip or just leave us with uh, a lasting thought. So um, Eric, I'm going to start with you and hopefully not putting you on the spot, but anything you haven't shared today that you want to get across, whether it's from the hiring or the onboarding process. Yeah, one thing I do want to put a, a piece of hope out there to candidates, right? Is So if you're out there looking for a job, there are good recruiters. There are some awful ones and they will go dark on you, but there are the good ones and they're the ones that are gonna call you whether you're qualified for the job or not. And they're gonna try to help you through this time, grab onto those people and help that and let them help you find that next gig. Um, it's something that I pride Live Ramp on is that I make sure that our team is in contact with candidates to give them the feedback and to truly make it a personal experience candidates deserve that respect. They put their time in, we owe that to them at the very, very least. So you'll find the great candidate, or the great hiring managers out there, I promise. I'm so glad to hear that. That's so, so good. And seriously, that should be the kind 100%. of uh, yeah. uh, attitude throughout throughout uh, widespread. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad, thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah. Hopefully the new standard going forward. Um, Wayne, what do you have to leave us with? Lasting thought or, or tip to share? I think it's great to to work with uh, with recruiters, but but I like Vivek's strategy. I think you should be identifying companies and industries that you have a, a strong interest that re that resonate with you, that you would generally be be passionate about, um, and uh, and looking for those connections that can help to to get you a referral. I think that's definitely going to be the best way to get your foot in the door, um, and uh, and and. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at least at, at Top Hatter, um, you know, we we have a hundred percent response rate. We respond to everybody that applies, regardless of where they come from. Because I, you know, as a philosophy, I feel that's the, the least that we can do for somebody that's taken the time out of their day to express some interest in in what we do. So even if it's not a strong fit at the moment, um, I I do think it. it, it it uh, it reflects on on you as a company, you know how you how you respond and whether you respond to to candidates that are that are applying for open open positions. So um, so for hiring managers out there, definitely take the time to to you know to respond back to candidates to share feedback when you decide that that you that, that it doesn't that it may not make sense to move forward. Um, and and for candidates, I, I think um, you know identify those opportunities that really resonate with you and and look for those referrals. I think that's the best way to to, to move forward. Great, thank you. Totally agree. Vivek, any other lasting tip or thought to share? No, I think I think we've covered a lot. Uh, I think it's uh, it's obviously a tough situation, so keep your hopes up. And uh, with lots of companies hiring, and 
let's uh, I, let's let's work together to come out of this. Amazing. Well, thank you, Vivek, Wayne, Erica. This was great. Really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to, to trying out some of these. And, and like you said, Vivek, you said it while getting to the other side. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks much. Thank you.